the final event of the Tokyo College International Women's Day webinar series. Tokyo College was established in 2019 as a new institution within the University of Tokyo to generate new knowledge to contribute to the creation of an inclusive society. Gender issue lies at the heart of the creation of an inclusive society. It is perhaps not surprising, therefore, that the inaugural lecture held at the Tokyo College two years before was on the very topic of envisioning a far more female future of Japan. The lecture was given by Mr. Bill Mott, whom we have the pleasure to invite again tonight to provide us with an update. Mr. Bill Emmott is a British journalist and writer who is best known globally for his 13 years as editor-in-chief of The Economist magazine. He's also well known in Japan for his many books and articles about Japan, including the most recent book, Japan's Far More Female Future, published by the Oxford University Press in 2020. He's a member of U Tokyo's Global Advisory Board, as he is also an Ushioda Fellow at the Tokyo College. We take this opportunity to thank Mr. Emot for his tremendous support for the activities of the Tokyo College as an Ushioda Fellow. And we would love to have you here back again in Tokyo when the international border reopens for everyone again. We also have here with us today Professor Shibase Sawako, who provided a vital insight as a discussion to Mr. Emot's lecture two years before. She's a professor of sociology in the Graduate School of Humanities and Sociology at the University of Tokyo. She has published numerous books on social stratification and inequality, including a leading English text on social inequality in Japan. And most recently, Todaijuku, Korekara no Nihon no Jinko to Shakari, which was published in 2019. She's currently an executive vice president of the University of Tokyo, and she's also the director of the University of Tokyo Center for Contemporary Japanese Studies. She has translated her research into public policy actions by serving on a number of government committees and councils, including the ongoing role as a leader of the committee to study the impact of COVID-19 on women in Japan. Since the dialogue between Mr. Emot and Professor Shirohase, Japan has gone through numerous events in the past two years. The crisis often affects and brings to surface the issues faced by the vulnerable. Here, I would like to acknowledge the victims of earthquake and tsunami and the nuclear meltdown that hit the northern Japan 10 years ago. Women, in moments of natural disaster and in moments of public alike, were disproportionately affected by the crisis. Today, both traditional media and out traditional media outlets and social media highlight issues of gender at the growing rate. Building on the painstaking work of numerous women who, as feminist scholars, activists, as daughters, as mothers, students, workers, and as individuals voice their opinions, the entrenched norms of gender inequality might be finally coming under public scrutiny. It is a pleasure to have both of you back again at Tokyo College in this historic juncture to provide us with an update on what the far more female future of Japan looks like now and perhaps in the future. Now, tonight's events might include the potentially disturbing content, including the situation surrounding women under COVID-19. We would like your engagement, but please feel free to leave the discussion if you feel uncomfortable at any moment of the discussion. Now, we will first invite Mr. Emot and Professor Shirahase to provide a brief update on the topic and I will follow up with some questions to facilitate the dialogue. We'll then have Q&A sessions by the audience. Thank you. And Mr. Lamott, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very, very much um, for that very kind introduction. 
and I'm delighted and honored to be uh, back uh, here at Tokyo College uh, and uh, two years, uh, around two years after that uh, uh, wonderful uh, experience of uh, being asked to give the inaugural lecture um, on uh, Japan's far more female future. I can say, first of all, that um, one of the things that I miss most thanks to this pandemic that has made me suffer in a way is my lack of opportunity to come not just to Japan, but to Tokyo College. So I too look forward very much to my uh, next opportunity to be able to come and uh, visit your campus and visit you all um, in person. Your mention of uh, the tragic events of uh, 10 years ago of uh, the uh, the Greater East Japan earthquake and tsunami and Fukushima disaster reminds me also to say that uh, uh, three or four weeks after that disaster, I, my wife and I were able to travel out to Japan and we did visit uh, Tohoku region, uh, including especially Ishinomaki and uh, Onogawa with the very kind help of a Japanese charity, the Japanese chapter of the Save the Children Fund. And it was a very, very moving um, experience and a very important uh, experience for us both. In connection with that uh, tragedy, I would also mention that uh, perhaps it's no coincidence that two of the uh, women that I featured, that I interviewed for my book, Japan's Far More Female Future, um, were uh, involved in the, uh, either in the actual uh, disaster and the uh, rescue effort or in the uh, aftermath, the rebuilding and reconstruction uh, economically and socially of the region. One, um, the chief executive of Kesenuma Knitting, uh, Mitarai-san, um, in running a company um, that has then created employment but also great value. Uh, the other, uh, Oikawa uh, Hideko, whose uh, denim company um, acted as an evacuation center for uh, many people um, in Kesenuma. So I feel some uh, connections even through this uh, piece of work. But let me come back to the topic of uh, your week's wonderful um, uh, group of seminars and lectures, which I wish I'd had the opportunity to be able to listen to and learn from. Uh, I think that uh, I always learn more by listening than I do by speaking. So therefore, I regret not having been able to uh, be with you and to share uh, the, that uh, learning uh, opportunity. In my time thinking about and trying to understand contemporary Japan, um, always one key puzzle, intellectual puzzle, has been to try to separate in my mind those elements of what is happening that are exceptional to Japan, Japanese society, Japanese economy, Japanese culture, and those elements that are common trends, common factors that one can see all around the world. Um, to what degree is Japan um, simply following the same social trend as other advanced economies, advanced societies, advanced countries, and to what extent is, are there exceptional characteristics? And I think uh, it's helpful in, for me at least, trying to analyze this question of uh, female role in Japan society, uh, economy, and uh, political life, to try to um, think in, in that uh, division. Over the last two years, it's clear that um, what has happened is that uh, in some ways there has been uh, one step backwards for uh, women's place um, in uh, society, the economy and political and public life, but also there have been some steps forward. The step backward is really the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that uh, has been uh, mentioned and discussed in some of your earlier uh, seminars this week. In the pandemic, it's clear that uh, women, because they occupy more uh, insecure employment roles, because they are more commonly in part-time and non-regular contract work, and because uh, they um, are considered to have be like last in uh, and therefore first to um, 
to lose their place or to or to uh, to be uh, to be um, redeployed, then they are vulnerable, more vulnerable than men. And secondly, because uh, women sh uh, take on um, a disproportionate uh, share of uh, the responsibilities in the home uh, and uh, especially for families in uh, childcare and child education, uh, and that the burden on uh, women has been uh, very large. Now that factor has, I think, been a worldwide phenomenon. It is not unique to Japan. Um, it's seen in the United States of America as well, where the level of female employment has fallen much, large, much more than men, than that of men during the pandemic. Uh, it's true also in the United Kingdom and in other European countries. And it reflects the existing inequality. It reflect, reflects the legacy of the past and very much the situation in the present. Um, that meant that women uh, were more vulnerable. And then when a shock like the pandemic happens, uh, that existing inequality gets, um, gets displayed um, even more clearly than, uh, than before. There are some uh, perhaps special characteristics, and I would um, cite the uh, data that has recently been much discussed in the media, namely the uh, a very sad rise in female suicide rate during um, the pandemic period, um, still considerably lower than uh, the rate of male suicide, but um, the rate of increase has been larger um, uh, among uh, women during uh, this past uh, one to two years of this crisis, which I'm sure reflects some of those same stresses that we have described. The step forward, uh, must be seen alongside that. I think that um, the progress of uh, gender equality and of uh, the assumption of a greater proportion of, uh, of leadership roles and a more equal sense of opportunity uh, in uh, this country um, is a long-term process. It's a process that's never going to be one achieved by revolution, by sudden changes but rather by a long-term evolution um, through a process of uh, pressure, of persuasion and education, and of generational change, and of the new demands and expectations and capabilities shown by new generations. And I think just in that two-year period, of course, it's a very short period to uh, try to look for substantial changes, but I think we can see uh, in that period, uh, some positive signs about the ability of uh, women to exert pressure and to exercise persuasion when um, incidents, scandals, um, unfortunate occurrences uh, take place, such as the statement by um, the chairman of the Tokyo Olympic Committee, uh, Mori Yoshihiro, um, that led eventually to his resignation. To me, as an as a Englishman, um, this scandalous comment that uh, Morisan made in that meeting was one that uh, is absolutely not special to Japan. This is something that could have been and will have been heard in every advanced country around the world at some stage in the last uh, half century. I think it's true that it's likelier to be heard now in Japan than it would be to be heard in the in the United States or in uh, Europe. But this is partly a reflection of the fact that an 80, an octogenarian, someone over 80 is still in a very lead, uh, powerful leadership and political position uh, in Japan. So reflecting the, the nature of the political hierarchy here, which is less true of European countries or of uh, the United States, at least in, in politics, although clearly not, not unknown since uh, America now has a president who's 78 years old. Um, but nevertheless, it's partly that um, legacy of a previous generation. So what is, what is positive to me about uh, the, that occurrence was the uh, degree of, uh, of pressure that was uh, exercised by, other, by female lawmakers uh, and in the media um, to not let this, this outrage uh, die quickly. Some of that pressure was international pressure. 
a form of gaiatsu um, because of the nature of the Olympics and the nature of international sponsorship of that event. But I think what was positive to me was the pressure internally uh, in Japan, in the Japanese media and in the Japanese uh, diet. At the same time, I think that looking over those just those two years, awareness of the issue of diversity uh, in companies has improved, has increased. Um, it's always hard to separate which with these issues, whether companies are just uh, using a slogan because it sounds good um, or whether they mean it sincerely. But I think that there has been an increase in pressure from investors, uh, from shareholders, um, investing in so-called ESG, environmental, uh, sustainable and governance uh, issues um, as measured by um, indexes that do this and that put pressure on companies to, to abide. And I do think that awareness of diversity um, has increased in those two years. So the opportune, the question always is whether the next generation of, uh, of women who are rising in organizations, whether they are universities or companies or, or uh, local authorities or other bodies, whether they are able to fulfill their opportunities and whether they have an equal possibility compared with men. And I would say that over two years, the possibility that they will have a more equal opportunity has improved, not dramatically, but bit by bit, it is improving. And I think that's the best one can say about this process because it's going to happen step by step, slowly over a long period. Um, and the important thing is to keep up attention on the issue, to keep up uh, persuasion, and to keep up pressure. And I congratulate Tokyo University and Tokyo College for playing your part in that education and pressure and persuasion. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Arnold, for this wonderful um, insights of the current situation. I would now like to invite Professor Shirahase to um, share her thoughts. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Such a great, you know, occasion, you know, to talk to you, Bill, and um, you know about how we have improved in the very core issue in the Japanese society. Actually, it has. It feels more than you know, long, uh, two years ago. You know, it, it was a first maybe the dialogue seminar um, at um, uh, in the Tokyo College. Actually, we have a very active discussion. The name of this is, you know, this this school, and uh, you know, Tokyo College and the college should be the right words or not. So every, you know, um, board members, including Bill, you know, uh, you know, actively discuss um, the names of this uh, institution. And now, it's many people, you know, uh, including very, you know, uh, prominent scholars, and not only the scholars like, you know, um, the Bill, like, um, you know, journalists, and working on Japan, you know, paying attention to this, you know, Tokyo College activities. So I have to also congratulate, you know, Tokyo College as well. And now it's, I mean, totally I agree with what Bill said. And, um, you know, the Japan has been characterized by very large gender gap. And the gender gap can be commonly across nations, no matter where it is, even, even in Sweden or North, uh, no, uh, Northern, you know, uh, in Europe, actually. So this is a quite common issue. But at the same time, the degree of the, this issue varies. So we can choose how much inequality is allowed in the society. I think this is the bottom line as a sociologist. So what kind of, you know, how, how, much, how much of degrees it is, you know, acceptable or not, this is not quite, you know, um, uh, productive type of, type, of, uh, type of argument. But, uh, you know, we, we have, you know, guarantee, you know, everyone to be uh, every, every, you know, human rights to everybody. This is a bottom line. So, and the gender issues also quite closely related to the human, uh, uh, you know, uh, human rights issues because 
what kind of options you have. That's a very basic, you know, human rights issue. Everyone, including, you know, no matter who you are, you know, can be enjoy, you know, uh, equal uh, degree of options. But reality is not so particularly for the young, you know, people, you know, they're not guaranteed to have the same extent of or same degree of various opportunities, including education opportunities. So that's a serious uh, point. So because of women, the, you know, uh, opportunities to, you know, go for it are uh, less, this is quite, you know, um, this is not um, acceptable at all. So this is a very basic line, uh, basic issue. So in order to make this, you know, Japanese society better or more profit, you know, we do need, you know, uh, improve this kind of inequality. And actually COVID-19 pandemic, you know, we all, you know, suffer with this kind of, you know, tragedy or challenging. So every country is no matter where you are, what kind of medical system you have, you know, what kind of, you know, demographic structures you have, we all suffer from this kind of pandemic. So in fact, how many patients do you have or and how many in the mortalities you're facing are quite different because of the difference in the social systems. But commonly, unfortunately, you know, women have a more serious impact of COVID-19 pandemic on their lives. So this is a very basic statistics, you know, uh, and how, how much women can get the negative impact, more negative impact of, of uh, pandemic than, you know, male counterparts is, you know, say in the number of those at work, Decline more seriously at the time of first pandemic uh, crisis in Japan, and an unemployment rate. Also, you know, we have very uh, serious trend, upper trend, and um, unemployment rate. This 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 slope is much much you know much you know, steep, steeper among the women, and particularly because women are more likely to be uh, in a part time job, non standard job. So the number of the job which which was lo lost uh, can be you know, found among the women. So these basic you know. Uh, result or consequences of negative consequences of COVID-19 pandemic is due to, as Bill said, existing inequalities, right? So, um, however, the, the most current serious situation which we can find is that even though we entered the second stage of you know, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we couldn't see this kind of obvious drop in macro statistics, unfortunately. We didn't show, we couldn't show uh, updated this statistics this time, but if you uh, updated this figure until very recently, say January or February, you know, you, you couldn't, you know, find the similar amount of drop in, uh, among, you know, female labor force uh, participation. In other words, it's getting, you know, more and more difficult to see what's happened at the um, at micro level. So the, if you can see the em, uh, employment rate, so you can see the obvious decline in, in, in women. But then uh, recently, it's not that easy to see what exactly happening inside. So th the thing is, you know, more complicated inside, but uh, visually it's hard to see. So in order to see, we have to, you know, look at more careful. That's that, that the other thing. And finally, what I like to mention at this point is that because of the COVID-19 is a quite international, you know, um, event, I mean, international phenomena, because of it, we can turn the, such a risk into the chance. Because Japan is very much characterized by segregated, society, segregated by the gender, segregated by age, but Japanese society, you know, hasn't that much open their own labor market and many things. So globally, Japanese society is less sensitive about, you know, overall movement. However, now it's, you can see the pandemic everywhere. 
So in other words, there is no choice not to listen other people's voice and other people's reaction. And in fact, people's movement are, you know, associated among the societies, including Japan. So Japanese labor market has already, you know, opened up, but still Japanese big guys believes that Japan is Japanese society. Immigrant, the number of immigrants is very much limited. So Japan consisted of very Japanese people, which wasn't true anymore. So that's why internally, you know, a recent, you know, tragic, you know, event uh, mentioned by Bill, you know, not only external pressure, but also internal pressure also works for you know uh, turning our problem into into the solution, but um, the environment uh, environment is getting more uh, is changing. In other words, this is a quite you know great opportunity to make our various risks and various serious issues into you know better way. But we have to work very hard. We have to work very hard across generation, not only the young people, but also you know middle and old age people as well. So um, we we shouldn't be very you know uh, optimistic about the future, but we have to work very hard to utilize such a potential to make our society more diverse. As Bill said, you know. You know, perceptions about diverse is changing quite a bit, particularly the last two years. I think that's true. And many people say that, okay, this is unfair. This is unfair because of the gender. So people can say more easily. So that's a big change. This is the right way to change. But in order to make this kind of, you know, starting point, you know, more firmly embedded in, into the society, we have to make extra effort to do so. I, I'm going to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Shirahase, for this wonderful and powerful insights on the, on the situation. Um, I would like to, at this point, remind the audience to please send in your questions and answers. This is your chance uh, to ask questions to people who have been working at the forefront uh, of these issues in Japan. So I might start. So I was going to ask, uh, what does what does far more female future look like to both of you? And I think you raised many issues. And one of one of the um, feature of far more female future would be, I think, hearing from you is increased women's participation uh, in the workplace. I wonder, first of all, if you have any questions about how to change the workplace in such a way um, that would make it more inclusive for women. And secondly, I had a question about, in a way, to the flip side of the question is, in order to increase um, women's participation in the workplace, um, one has to also value the, the care work that women do uh, in, the, in the home. So for example, I'm here I'm thinking of an example of paternity leave. A lot of companies are beginning to implement the paternity leave options for male employees. Um, still, the takers of this paternity leave remains a minority. And even when they do so, majority only take for one week. And according to government research, the biggest hurdle that was identified by male employee was the lack of understanding by the people in a managerial position. So I would like to ask both of you, if you were speaking to uh, people in a managerial position, how would you communicate the value of paternity leave or the care labor um, at home in the workplace? I, after after you, Shirahase Sensei. Me? Okay. Yes. Why not? Okay. Okay. Thank you for very um, you know difficult questions to ask you from the beginning. Okay. Um, I have to being inclusive or make it inclusive. We have to work very hard 
you know, we can't, you know, change the world, you know, without any, you know, discretion or some special uh, or additional uh, consideration. So being inclusive means we have to pay more attention to say minorities. For instance, diversity is not, um, you know, it's not a random type of uh, random type of diversity. So we have the majority and min minority. But I think this is a first step to pay extra attention to minority. It's a um, you know big big step you know to make the society inclusive. Then why we have to make an extra attention to the minority or for the majority you know they felt that this is quite unfair because why because of a human woman why you know you can get you know better chance to be promoted however the last 20 or 30 years we have been quite unfairly treated in, in many aspects it may not you know, nobody can blame that, even though we we are enjoying this kind of extra attention or extra opportunities to get. So this is a longer term. So this is a kind of a catching up. However, because this is a kind of a stretch, special treatment to make the society inclusive. So next, you know, couple of years, some particular people with particular background may be may enjoy may be able to enjoy some special treatment but this is only the first starting point so even though you can take uh, you you treat it very specially at at the you know open the door then once you close the door you have to show your you know what you you have done that is an you know that is a more important point so you know showing some you know providing special opportunities or special treatment uh, from uh, from some you know uh, group with a certain uh, attribute or some certain background but this is only the first you know first place and the first uh, uh, this is just only one time so to make this society more inclusive as I said in repeatedly you know this first pressure, Everyone has to take advantage of this fast pressure, but in other words, this is not that easy. So, uh, you know, uh, maybe the woman has to work in very hard, but again, you know, how, you know, we nurture or how we can provide equal opportunity to all, then, you know, temporary special treatment or special consideration is quite legitimate. I think it is quite, there. That's that's the one thing. Can I? So I I agree very much with uh, what uh, Shirahase Sensei says. Maybe I'll add say that I think um, I agree. I think uh, special treatment in the short term is often necessary in certain characteristic in certain fields, which you know special quotas uh, are, are a good idea, but they must be time limited. They must be uh, not a permanent change, but rather something to to uh, jumpstart, to to give a, a to produce a more rapid change, but also accompanied by a broader effort to uh, make organizations more inclusive in a sustainable way, in a long-term sustainable way. And I think to do that requires uh, leadership from the very top, um, leadership that seeks to change human resources uh, decisions and human resources policies towards treating both men and women in an equal way, but also in a way that is conscious of the fact that they are parts of families and that their families need to be considered uh, in a general way. So the tradition in Japanese companies of telling a, ma a male employee that he is going to be transferred to Moscow in two weeks time uh, and that uh, his family will not be able to travel with him uh, and that they just need to look after themselves. That is also discriminatory against that man and the, and the family situation. And it says that the organization doesn't care about 
um, the interests of the whole family. It basically depends on, on simply a single re relationship with one part of the family. Mm -hmm. And I think that has to change. Yes. And the paternity leave um, issue is one tool through which to change that uh, or to start to change that. Um, you are right, uh, it was on that, uh, that uh, many companies have in introduced this, and in fact the legal rights are better in many ways in, in Japan than in many other countries, but the uh, actual act take up of this is very low, and the reason is because companies do not uh, instruct or persuade their male employees that they should take paternity leave, mm. and they do not in the mode of management um, send the signal or the instruction that the whole family is part of the concern of the employer rather than simply uh, the single employee. Mm -hmm. I if I was the chief executive or chairman of a big Japanese company, mm -hmm. I would make paternity leave compulsory for um, my employees, uh, for my male employees of a certain minimum amount Okay, if there is, uh, maybe there are some exceptional circumstances, but I would say that in that case, the person who wishes to not take one month maternity leave or whatever I set as the amount, maybe three months, whatever <laughs> is the right amount, um, yeah. they have to explain to me why, why they should not do it. So this principle of comply or explain is I think a good way to uh, set up uh, rules and governance. Um, and so the, at the top of the company, you should say the expectation is that all of you take this, this paternity leave. But if you can't do it, you explain to me as the leader of the company why, and I will, I will uh, judge uh, whether or not your excuse is a good one. So that sends a, a definite message that, uh, that what is expected for the future is a more equal relationship between men and women, but also that the company realizes that um, its interest is in having a harmonious and supportive relationship with the whole family yeah. uh, of its employees. And that's the key, that it must have that relationship with the whole family. Um, and other countries have gone through the same cycle. Yeah. When, I, when I was um, uh, in senior executive position at The Economist, we definitely went through an evolution. I think when I was a junior, there, it was much more common just simply to transfer the man and not have much uh, awareness of, of what his, uh, his uh, spouse and his family thought about the idea. Uh, but this became impossible and unacceptable. Uh, and uh, by the time I was uh, chief editor transferring people, I had to think about the whole family um, and to balance the interests. And I think that that's the right responsibility for organizations. and. Um, uh, I think it's very, very good in, uh, I, I think, do think that leadership from the top is important. And I think uh, President Gonokami has uh, set a good example um, in this way during his term and, uh, and Shirahase Sensei's term as executive vice president also. But, um, you know, uh, Bill uh, mentioned a very, you know, important point. Compulsory, you know, provision must be, uh, helps a lot within the short period of time. People cannot, you know, choose one or zero, you know, this, uh, I mean, Jane Ferry, we have potentially have some prejudice, some kind of ex expectations, you know, people have this kind of existing, you know, framework. So in order to break through, you know, existing framework to make, you know, to step forward, you know, sometimes people has to, you know, you know, has a kind of, uh, experiences which they have done before, you know, this is a great chance to make them changed, I think. And furthermore, I think this is innovation. Innovation means, you know, uh, nobody knows nothing at this point, but through raising a case or, you know, having, you know, different kinds of relations with different people, you know, you have some kind of ideas and furthermore, and the people has different kinds of potentials, which never seen or never knows before. But the Japanese society has a very strong assumption that, or very strong one, you know, very strong expectation based on the gender or age. 
you know, so uh, this stereotype of expectation is really, really high. And if you betray this kind of expectation, you're going to punish very badly. You know, something that feels so bad because, you know, um, my, you know, act is completely different or against, you know, majority people, uh, the expectation from the majority of people. So I felt so bad then, but uh, this is not good for, you know, many people because people can have different preferences and different strengths, no matter, you know, you're a woman or man. So we have to very, uh, I mean, aggressive about finding out very good, you know, potential in each people. Then you can, you know, um, change your mindset to see the people. So in other words, maybe the care work also um, underestimated in Japanese society as well, because, you know, the Japanese society, you know, put this, you know, care work and the family responsibilities within, you know, existing, you know, framework. But, it, you know, that's, that's a problem. I, I will just add as a, as a, as a man, um, that uh, I think we uh, uh, need to acknowledge that this imbalance of care work is absolutely a universal issue worldwide. Yeah. Yeah. It's not. Uh, it's That's not true. just a Japanese issue. Statistically, it, it remains wider the gap in Japan than in many other countries. But in other countries, it is also is also yeah. quite wide. Right. So uh, I think this is this is this is a universal question. Um, and next to it, I think one should can add that there is an extra difficulty in in Japan for um, families, which is the difficulty of of uh, hiring um, help in the home, particularly uh, childcare help in the home. Um, and uh, I think that um, uh, while this, there's a strange inequality in which expatriate uh, employees in, in Tokyo, in Japan, are allowed to uh, import, uh, recruit um, foreign um, maids and uh, childcare workers to work in their home, but uh, these visas are not available to Japanese uh, citizens, which then raises the cost of uh, doing it and makes it out of reach for uh, most families. I would change that law uh, right away if I was prime minister. <laughs> but I think this is also a very common future. I mean, common problem is seen in other societies as well, in the United States as well. This is a quite you know, basic, deep you know, immigrant issue. I mean, this is gender issues and about immigrant issues. Yeah. So that sense we can share. However, why this degree of the gender gap so high in Japan? Then, you know, that's an, you know, core question. We haven't had, um, you know, good answer, but. Um, Thank you so much. It's such an exciting discussion that questions are flowing in and related to this topic. Uh, so I will read some of them. Um, first of all, by Sayako Ono-san. Thank you for your talk. According to Yamaguchi 2017, only 30% of female university graduates can move up to management position in their companies. What do you think about this? And I'll also read one more question uh, by Jenny Corbett. She asks, what sector do you think might show the way in raising the status of women? whether by quotas or other means, will, be, will it be universities or are there other sectors that are leading the way? Next bill, please. Well, okay, I will answer about uh, sectors leading the way, maybe, um, in that first of all, I, I, I think the sector in, in Japan that's most disappointing to me in this area is the media. And I feel this because I'm obviously have a background in the media. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think the, the the media has been very behind in uh, both uh, writing about and speaking about this issue, but also especially in uh, the opportunities that it is given to female uh, journalists and uh, and executives. Uh, there is no major Japanese publication or news outlet that has a female editor. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I, what I would like to see is for the media to make a very special effort to maybe jumpstart this in the way that uh, Shirahase Sensei said in about uh, in, in seeking to 
for a period give special effort to to raise women to senior positions because i think that then changes the form of communication and changes the attention and the the messages that the media is putting out um, so i think the media is behind but it it should be an opportunity to jump ahead i do think that universities are generally better um, uh, nationwide. I hesitate to, met, to talk about Tokyo University. I leave that to Shikase <laughs> Sensei. But I think uh, nationwide uh, universities are able to lead the way to a certain extent. And I would think that uh, in some universities, quotas would be a good, a good idea, also because of the formative influence that uh, female teachers and female uh, executives can have. Um, in universities and in encouraging high school uh, changes as well. So I would single out those two. I suppose the third thing I'd say, I'd like to see more female entrepreneurs because as, yes. uh, as female as female led companies grow, then those women leading those companies are able to change their, to create their own cultures, their own organizational culture. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and that then can make a big difference. Yeah, but becoming an entrepreneurship is a little bit small in number in Japan, both men and women. So I think this is going to be a great opportunity for the you know next future because how to raise your own business and think this is a quite you know good potential. But I agree. But I wish I have more you know good leaders and I, you know more female in science area. So um, in a high, particularly higher education, uh, this is an you know main area where the people can have an you know so-called human capital. So if you have the human capital as much as you know man, uh, between man and woman, so you have the same potential. So if the labor market provide the same amount of or the same quality of the chances, you know man and woman have a better chance to you know work in the various area. So um, the sec maybe the first question about 30% of you know university graduate only they climb up to the managerial uh, managerial uh, status. I don't have you know comparable you know figures for men, but unfortunately you know in Japan particularly you know women with higher education has show the least you know per percentage. Uh, to stay in the labor market. So um, higher, uh, highly educated women are more likely to uh, get married to a highly educated man. So the highly educated men are more likely to have a pay more. So so-called Douglas Arizona hypothesis. So once you get married to the well of the man, so women uh, less more uh, less likely to stay in the labor market no matter how much you get the education. But situation are changing right now. So the things are that this number and um, hopefully they can get it higher. But again, we do not enjoy the same amount of promotion chances within the you know, institution, within the corporation. And the father and the father more in the woman show them more likely uh, to, to more likely to show the intermittent type of type of work trajectory. So this is as a, as a result, the percentage of women who climb up to the managerial uh, manager status are quite low. That's that's unfortunate, but hopefully it's getting higher. I, I would only add that um, I think that in experience in other countries has been that once you get to a kind of critical mass of women in the kind of middle management positions, yeah. then some of the decisions that they are part of and that they make, then make it easier for the next generation, not deliberately, but just because they have a different mindset. Yes. Um, and, yeah. uh, and Japan is not yet at that critical mass, but in the next decade, there is a chance that it will be. Um, and that uh, certainly this is the view of the doyen of uh, gender equality campaigning and writing Bando Mariko at uh, Showa Women's University uh, and formerly in the, in the cabinet office. Uh, she, she, I know, argues that there is going to be an yeah. increase that then will create a critical mass. Yeah. 
I think Krika Mas, I mean, 30% is an empirical proof. And uh, this is a counters, you know, um, classic work, which I respected a lot, I have to confess, because when I went to the Harvard, she was in business school, and then um, I was influenced by her, you know, jobs, uh, pretty much. And this is the point, you know, we do need you know, critical mass to make the society change. So this is the important point. That's why we need the pressure to make the doors open anyhow. Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and I'm glad you mentioned the intergenerational issue as well, because uh, that was the next question that I was going to refer to. Uh, but Marie Kondo, sorry. she says, I feel that younger generation, both men and women are trying to find what kind of inequalities there are in Japanese society, not only one based on gender, but also sexual orientation, birthplace, etc. In contrast, the older generation seems to be less sensitive to these issues. So how can we update this current situation of Japan as an aging society? So I think she's referring to intergenerational issues. And here I might just um, also ask one question that I had to both of you. Um, I wonder if you, uh, Mr. Emot, if you can refer to your role in the media as well to talk about these uh, emerging voices among women using social media. Um, even though when they do so, they do get some uh, hate speeches as well. Uh, so I wonder if you had some comments about um, the boundaries between the traditional media and social media in raising these issues and how these voices can be protected. Um, and Professor Shirohase, you have been heavily involved in, in transfer, transforming your research into public policy by speaking on many yes. government uh, committees, including one, the impact of gender, impact of COVID-19 on gender. So I wonder if you could also refer to your experiences of sometimes bridging this gap um, with, between the politics. Um, and the okay, and thank you for mentioning it. But you know, um, nowadays the one of the area, evidence-based social, you know, uh, policies, one of the you know emerging area, which you know in which not only the social sciences but also the sciences or humanities are working together. So this is emerging area, but then at the same time, many more people like to join this area because we can't you know change the policies just because I don't like it, or it looks like like that. I do need the data, what kind of people are using, what kind of people, you know, fail to use it, what the consequences of these policies. So, um, you know, without this kind of evaluation, we can make or put a lot of money to make a new policies. So um, we're, the, you know, sociologists or social scientists trained in academic, so the role of the, you know, uh, our role and the other people's role in, in a bureaucracy might be different, but the different kind of, you know, people with different you know, professionals working together, you know, and, um, you know, move very fast. This is an another point. So people should use, you know, professional knowledge as much as possible or as effective as possible, which Japanese society is not that good at. So um, I think this is a way it was. So I feel so fortunate to work this kind of, you know, uh, with, you know, this kind of opportunity. So I feel so fortunate and thanks for other, my colleague as well. Okay. And um, what else? Uh, actually generational gap. Can I, can I talk to you this generation gap? Yes. I think education is a key. Keep saying that this is politically you know, wrong, oh, you know, keep saying that this is an, you know, education is a, you know, uh, key to make the people, people's perception changed. You know, when you're a mom and dad, okay, say, okay, don't cry because, you know, you're a boy, you know, don't cry, even though she's a feminist, without consciousness, she might say that. So I'm not sure this kind of deep you know emotion is quite natural or not we are not sure because every kind of expectation and norms has already existed affect your own behavior this is true this is entirely true however in order to make other people's uncomfortable 
you know, we have to take extra consideration. So in order to make extra consideration, we do need, you know, education. So this is, education plays a key role. And I would add that I think in that education, the media plays an important role. Um, I mean, looking at, uh, at this question of generational change, uh, let's accept it. It's always the case that the older generation is the conservative part um, in every society and the younger generation are more ag innovative, agitating for change, more conscious of, of some inequalities. I think it's been always true, but what has happened thanks to demography is that the older generation is now larger <laughs> than in the past. I know. Yes, this is the classic <laughs> in politics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a reality. But media makes it possible for the younger generation to have a louder voice, uh, I think. And in analyzing the question about media that you, uh, Ito-san, uh, asked very, uh, sens very pertinently, I think we, have to, we should distinguish between three types of media. Main traditional media, digital media, and social media. Okay. Uh, mainstream media have been very conservative and slow and in uh, drawing attention to inequality issues and really need to improve their game. Uh, hopefully the competition that's growing from digital media for their readers and for their business will pressure them to do that. Um, but it's been slower in Japan than it has been in some other countries. Um, the, the traditional media have had a stronger economic position to be able to be slow and to be rigid and conservative. But digital media is a source of optimism because it is typically in those new online companies, the opportunities for young people, which includes women, uh, young women, to uh, get to a position of more responsibility and more voice quickly is greater. So there's a chance for those young voices raising questions of all kinds of inequalities to emerge more quickly. Uh, and so digital media, I think, is a very positive part of this process of social change. Social media is much more difficult. Yeah. Social media does increase the possibility for people, young people, to uh, express their voice, but also it produces more hatred and more, um, more uh, attacks, more more um, more nastiness, more more uh, more hostility, um, because it's semi-anonymous. And uh, I'm afraid the basic um, instincts, negative instincts of people, are able to voice themselves. So social media is much more problematic. Um, but that's true in every country, by the way. Um, every country, in every country, particularly women speaking out on social media, uh, get uh, get a terrible um, treatment. Um, on, on that social media. But let's be uh, positive in the sense that it at least provides some voice, but more important is innovative digital media and the pressure it can put on mainstream media. And then if mainstream media can carry these messages and these issues, these narratives more widely, then I think that stands a chance also of educating the older generation and mm. convincing them that that uh, so, social change is happening and mm. uh, is, needs to be embraced and managed. Thank you so much. Now I have to do the most difficult task of closing a seminar when the conversation is so interesting. Um, sorry for the audience who provided me with amazing questions and we couldn't get through them all. Um, but the time has come, unfortunately. So I would like to close the session. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Emot and Professor Shirahase for your participation in the dialogue today. We've learned so much. And I also like to thank my colleagues at Tokyo College, especially um, Eureka Fall and Kyle Fasius for the collaborative work in brainstorming and running this series of webinar together, and the director Haneda and the wonderful team at the Tokyo College for the generous support of this program. Um, thank you very much also for everyone, the audience in tonight's webinar for your presence and, uh, and the support. And for those who have attended more than one event uh, in Tokyo College IWD uh, webinar series for your companionship as we together travel through this one past one week. 
Uh, we very much hope that this conversation will continue beyond this webinar on the screen. There will be a brief survey after closing the window. So please let us know how you found these seminars and if there are any other topics you'd like, so you'd like us to cover in the future. On this note, thank you very much again, and I hope you have a good night.